So I'm going to focus on the very interesting low penetrance and our uh, mosaic, which we talked about earlier. Um, so I'm happy to have more discussion around that. Um, I'll just remind you, you know all this, trilateral, uh, patient has one written copy, and they are there for now, that's new terminology. And then the non-heritable are H0. We didn't talk at all about the non-heritable unilateral that have um, normal RB1 genes. There's 2% of these unilateral patients who are very, very young, who are not, the tumor is not caused by damage to the tumor suppressor gene, but rather overexpression of an oncogene driving the proliferation. They are very aggressive tumors, um, and uh, they're quite rare. I think we know about 35 of them in the world now. And they were first published in 2013, but of course, they've always been there. They just weren't recognized before. Oh, this is showing how very young they are. The median age of diagnosis is 4.5 months for unilateral, where does the unilateral um, with RB1 mutated in the tumor for both copies, the median age is 24 months. And they have very high levels, very high copy number of the McGann gene. And they are very aggressive. They look different. They look like a neuroblastoma packed full of the McGann protein with double nucleoli, not like a retinoblastoma, but they are retinal origin. They're not a neuroblastoma because they have retinal markers. And they're growing, here's one at a four month old, growing through the lamina cribrosa and into the optic nerve already at four months. Um, I'm going to uh, go to the results from impact genetics, which uh, from July 12, 2016, and by the way, in the eCancer Care database on the genetic page, when you go there, you'll see that the lab that did the test has to show how many they tested and how many they found a mutation in to get a percentage test sensitivity is meant to be entered into the database to kind of force the issue to say, what's the sensitivity of the lab? But for bilaterals, we find 97% looking at blood um, in bilaterals. And if we have tumor from a unilateral, we find 96% of the tumors, we find the two mutations in both, in both RB1 mm -hmm. genes. And then of this group where we were able to fully report the unilateral, 12 of those were McCann tumors. Um, interestingly, for the unilaterals, um, we, we, in impact genetics, we find 17% carry a germline mutation when we test them. The standard figure since the 1950s uh, has been 15% of unilaterals and the first data was based on the breeding experiment. So of uh, adults who had children 15% with who had unilateral, 15% of them would have one or more children with retinoblastoma. So 15% was all that could be detected by that breeding experiment. And it's probably closer to this as you get into more details and more fancy techniques to find them. What's really interesting is that for all patients, unilateral or bilateral, the percentage mosaic is 6 to 7 percent across the board. So to me, that's interesting. It means that retinoblastoma is one disease, because that proportion of everyone is, is that same figure. But if you look at the 117 unilaterals that did have a mutation, 44 percent are mosaic which we didn't really anticipate, but it's what you should think. The reason they're unilateral is because they're mosaic. So let just... So this is what mosaicism is. And that beautiful picture you showed, David, is the perfect example of a mosaic where each piece of the tile is a different color, making patterns with a beautiful, beautiful picture. I didn't know Pandora had hope in her box. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> for, the inherit for the heritable, not inherited, that's incorrect. It should be heritable because in this example, the mutations in the egg or the sperm, that was not inherited. It's heritable. This is the first member of the family to carry the mutation. And the whole child has that mutation in every cell of their body. 
but when the mutation happens or that cosmic ray passes through the planet and breaks the gene, that child was a multi-cell embryo and only one cell in the embryo had a mutation in the gene. So the child has many cells that do not, that are perfectly normal and these brown patches on this baby would be the ones that would be at risk for retinoblastoma in the eye or other cancers throughout the child. So um, it's very interesting to think of the role of mosaicism. Um, we published a paper recently uh, that actually was embargoed to, with the TNM release because we used the new TNM classification and so we couldn't publish the paper until the book came out at the same time. And it, we looked at prenatal versus postnatal screening for familial retinoblastoma. <coughs> we actually, oh, just come back here. You see that Vikaskatan is on this paper. And when were you in Toronto? 2005. So that paper's been worked on since 2005. Yes. Vikas started the paper and worked on it and kept asking us when we were going to get around to finishing it. But we kept collecting a few more and we kept working on different things. And finally, we published it. Um, the experiment that we report is a retrospective clinical study of children who all were H1. They all turned out to be H1. But the first group of eight patients, we did not know their genetics. They had a parent with retinoblastoma, but we didn't know if they had were H1 or H0 the day they were born at the normal time in pregnancy. The others um, were 12 patients. We did an amniocentesis. <coughs> they were H1 before they were born. They were at 100% risk for actually bilateral retinoblastoma. And it's true for the whole group. Every child in this study got bilateral retinoblastoma. Um, and so they were delivered electively or earlier. So this is the normal time of birth, and this is four weeks earlier. And then we looked at outcomes. And you can see the green symbols up there all mean we've, they failed to save the eye. Some of them still have the eye, but we had to use radiation. So that's technically a failure. And other, other details there. So this is the. Um, First group, group one, the eight children that were at HX at the day they were born, and these are the ones that were H1 and born four weeks early because they were H1. And what we're showing is the, the success rate to save the eye. Um, I'm not showing the vision and all these other things, but it's very, very interesting um, how much better they do if you start to get a hopeful four week head start. They had other, other positive features like vision was better, all sorts of other things and less treatment, less invasive treatment. <coughs> um, this is our new data. Oh, wait a minute, I thought this should be another slide. Yes, I'll go to this first. Uh, um, Dr. Scallop in uh, KCI Institute has set up a working group at the, at the related to the American Academy of Ocular Pathology to actually generate management guidelines for when you should examine children with retinoblastoma. And this is uh, the high risk are those who have a parent with retinoblastoma or an H1 proven, which would be 100% um, risk. Uh, and would they exam be examined without anesthetic or with anesthetic. So the green would be for the first four weeks, and we actually go over three months in Toronto. If they don't have a tumor, we don't give them an anesthetic. We can see the whole retina. In fact, we can photograph the whole retina. In Toronto, we also um, study these with uh, not only RETCAM, we do RETCAMs to the periphery on them, and we, because the camera sometimes sees what we don't, but what really finds macular tumors is OCT. So we do awake OCTs on them in the clinic and find tumors. The minute they have a tumor, then they start in these ways because we start to treat right away. And then the low risks would be less than 1%. So I hope we end up to calling that H0 is less than 1% by different calculations. But that's still higher than the general population. Although this was 1 in 15,000. I'll change it to 1 in 16. Thank you, David. Um, no, thank you.
Daryl, Daryl pointed just to one in 16,000, yes. yes. Um, um, and then they got anesthetics. But in generating all this in the working group, the question came up uh, for a unilateral patient or a bilateral patient, what is the risk that the second child in the family will get retinoblastoma? So what's the risk that there's an unaffected carrier parent? <coughs> now, way back, maybe in the 80s, Maria Mussarella and I wrote a paper before we had an RV gene to study. And we concluded in trying to calculate risks that the parent, a parent, doesn't matter which one, would be at 10% risk to be a carrier. We actually had some suggestions from clinical data that that might be in the right ballpark, but we used 1% because it was 0.1 and it was easy to do the calculations in your head. If it was 0.5 or 0.7, you couldn't do it in your head. And that was all that was in it. Um, and when they asked the question of this working group of us at Impact Genetics, what's the data? We had a hard time finding it, a hard time getting it. Of all those thousands of mutations we've studied in different people, they're in three different databases, they have different levels of data, and that we didn't have a good flag on the variance of unknown significance. We actually had called that, but the data was a very tricky job, much harder than I thought it would be to do that. And that's what this is. So this is the data. So for bilateral probands, they had a 3% risk of having an unaffected carrier parent. Whereas the unilateral probands had a 9% risk. Does that surprise you? Yes. It surprised me. Yeah. I, I really didn't know what the answer would be, thinking about it. But that proves that we aren't thinking well enough. Because when you look here, the bilateral probands have a high rate of the unaffected parent is a mosaic. And so the mutation they carry is full penetrance, but they don't get a disease because it didn't happen to be in the retina that, that, or something. The mosaicism, they're low level mosaics. But the child will get bilateral disease because it's an ordinary mutation. And they do have some reduced penetrance, but look at the unilaterals. There's very few are mosaic in the carrier parent. And a big preponderance of low reduced penetrance, which is actually what we should expect. And the reduced penetrance, so both the parent, the parent had no tumors and the child had one. So it all the logic of it is to me quite interesting because it's kind of just a logic exercise. And we should have thought of this before we had the data. You know that if you've established mosaicism, <coughs> yes. With your screening from the slide before, does yes. that, do you screen them differently if they if the parent is mosaic, or are they just still high risk? That each pregnancy is still high risk. Even a if the parent mosaic? is mosaic, that's a very good question. Uh, if the parent is mosaic, or if you don't know about the parent, it could be mosaic. Yeah. Um, the risk for, even if you can't measure the mosaicism of the parent, the risk for the baby that they are, that the parent is a mosaic, and the risk of the baby is 100%. If the baby gets that cell, the baby is not going to have low penetrance disease, they're going to have full blown bilateral disease. So Dietmar Lohmann came up with the idea that in Babies up, up, where there could be a carrier mosaic parent, those infants should be either genetically tested at birth, which is the cheapest thing to do, or looked at right away at birth. They become equivalent sort of to an H1 until you know they're not mm -hmm. at birth. If they're already a year old and they haven't got anything, the risk's gone way, 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 way down. But their risk is in the, the day they're born, I'm very, very close to it. Of course, they may have no tumor at birth, and get it two months later. So the best thing to do is to do the genetic test. Uh, um, if, if, but you don't always, you don't have to always have a genetic test. Very, very interesting. So we started doing that now, and we persuaded the Ontario government to pay for their genetic test when there's a 
uh, like for the sibling of, of a patient. We know the mutation, test the baby for that. No one mutation and, and, and then the kids. Most likely is going to be H0, but a proven H0. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good question. Right. Yes. So for the unilateral problems, you test uh, 207, and only 19 parents found mutation. That's correct. Uh, according to the, uh, I can, can compare with the Chinese results. Yes. Uh, it's very we, similar. Yeah, we test for the unilateral test. 234 and uh, six parents was found the condition. Yes. Uh, six. You have six parents. So. Uh, uh, no, it's less than you. Yes, did, but uh, my question is did we test both parents in every case? I, you know, all those details? I think we test both parents. For the, for the unilateral mutation was found. Uh, 29 for the program. 29 parents who carried a mutation. No. 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 Uh, so so 260, <coughs> what does that mean? It means the uh, mutation was found in the program? No. The, there were 207 parent SATs tested for, for these unilateral children. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Parents. Yeah. parents. Yeah, yeah, this is the parents. Uh, the parents of them were tested. That's how they made it into this study. <coughs> but the discussion John and I are having shows the data has to be really looked at carefully. We worked very hard and we thought we had more than this, but then we kept peeling away ones that actually were familiar and actually were this and that, and to get to the real clean data set. But it's quite interesting. Um, The unaffected carrier parent? Uh -huh. We have no idea. There's no database on their health. Uh -huh. This is all too new. They haven't gotten old enough to to get new tumors. No, nobody's looked. But we would expect that the mosaic child and the unaffected carrier parent, this child is going to be at lower risk for second primary tumors because they have less cells at risk. And some of these are 1%. Only 1% of their cells carry it carry the mutation. Some of them are 20, some of them are 50, and they'd be at a higher risk, we presume, but no one's measured that. If we can get a cancer care with every retinal blastoma patient on it, then we'll know what happens to them through their life, but right now we have no idea. But it's interesting on, I go to, This study, here we said general population risk was 0 0.07, and we consider low risk less than 1%. But now I want to go back to that and modify that for unilateral, but relevant to the carrier. All these calculations <coughs> include the risk of a parent having a, a, a being an unaffected carrier, and now we have data to modify that. And I think we will make it so that if it's a bilateral, Band, the risk that the parent's a carrier is 5% to make it easy, and the risk for unilateral is 10%. So that will change the relationship of low risk, and we might get much less than 1% in certain circumstances. You know, we won't go higher than that, but we might get even less to make that H0 definition clear somehow. But there's a lot of work, as you can see, to be thinking through that. And it requires thinking of a lot of people, because someone will see an error in our thinking in one way or the other by working across a large group, collaborators. So I'd like to turn it over to Sandra.